Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's live q and I'm here with Don of By Don Nicole or Don Nicole Designs. And Don is a lettering artist and professional blogger, and she is killing it at blogging. We were just talking about that. And she's going to walk us through today how she does that as a business and actually makes money doing it, which a lot of people don't realize is even a thing. So welcome, Don. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> So blogging, if you, I'm an introvert. I love that I can work from home. I was just telling Becca, she was like, you have all these questions about my scrap box behind me. Um, but the other benefit, I was like, uh, do, should I also show them that I'm still like in my pajama <laughs> pants and I have a sick kid sitting in my bedroom. Um, blogging from home is ideal for me. I'm an introvert, um, like hermit level. And I think when people think of hand lettering, you think you have to do wedding suites, or you have to work with big clients, which I have done in the past. I've worked with Krispy Kreme and Hobby Lobby, but at the end of the day, it just didn't fit my personality and it wasn't what I loved. And blogging is my wheelhouse. I can um, work on my own schedule, set my own deadlines and make money and really good money just blogging and um, putting out my own e-products. So if you guys have questions about that, um, if I'm looking this way, this way, I don't know which way it goes on the camera. Um, I am just looking at the feed to see what questions you guys have. Um, and if you don't have a ton of questions, I'll just kind of get started with how I ended up blogging as a full-time business. Yeah, for sure. Um, but uh, before we get there, I just want to pop up your website on the screen here so anybody can go and see it because you should have a look at Dawn's blog. It is crazy. There's so much content on there. And a lot of you that are listening, I know are people who want, oh my God, wait, is this working? Are you looking at the feed right now? Um, it looks like we're, wait. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah it's working. I Sorry. Know. Now I got to pause it because I can hear it. Look at this stereo. So my, my program right now is showing me that it's not running. Hang on a second. Guys, if you can hear us contemplating whether this is working, give us a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I got to open it up on my phone and make sure that this is working because this is so weird. It looks like it's working. All right. Whether this is working. Okay, it's working. We're good. It's working. Okay. My program is saying that I could should start the broadcast right now. That's so weird. Anyway, what I was saying is that you should go to Dawn's website, which is popped up on the screen right now, and check out her blog because there's so much content on there, and so many people in here want to learn lettering. And just to learn lettering, it's a great resource. But also, if you're looking at starting a blog, it's such a good example. So I'm curious, Dawn, when did you start it, and like how did this all become a thing for you? So I am married to an Air Force man, and uh, we had left Charleston, South Carolina about 10 years ago and moved to a little tiny town in Oklahoma. And we literally had nothing but a Walmart and a McDonald's, and I had three babies under three, and I just needed an outlet. So I started blogging as a hobby because it was what a lot of my friends were doing. At that time, I was blogging about sewing and food and nothing really art-related. Um, I did it as a hobby for a couple of years and I decided my background is in, um, I have an English undergraduate degree and then I worked in the field of human resources and hospitality, uh, like resorts and hotels. And I loved human resources, but it, it's not a mobile career. So I went back to school for graphics. I, I went and got my MBA in human resource management because I, I didn't realize I would get married and move every one to three years. And so I decided to go back to design school and that was, um, the end of 2012. And when I did that, my teachers just said, you have a knack for typography. I just fell in love with letters and they didn't teach lettering. So I just, sorry, there's a fly buzzing around my head, driving me crazy. Um, I just bought books on Amazon and started practicing and learning um, to teach myself how to do lettering and brush calligraphy. Um, and I've never really looked back. Um, all that to say, I actually did. The first time I picked up a brush pen was tragic. It was so bad, I didn't do it again for months. So if you're learning and you're struggling with it, you will get there. I'm a lefty, I have bad handwriting, um, and the first time I did it, it was horrible. So if I can do it, truly anybody can. Um, so blogging was, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. 
because it was never supposed to be a business. It was just a creative outlet for me. And things just kind of snowballed. Um, and there came a point when I got a phone call or an email, and it was from a third party that works with Hobby Lobby, and they wanted some of my lettering they had seen on Pinterest. And I deleted the email. I thought it was spam because that just doesn't seem likely. But it was real. And that was the point at which I said, maybe this could be a business. I should look at registering it and making a business plan. Um, you know, and putting all my ducks in a row to be legal to operate as a business. Um, and that's what was really the catalyst for it being what it is now. That's such an awesome story because I, I love that you said it was an accident. You're an accidental entrepreneur because the same thing is true for me. Um, but how did, like, at what point did the blogging part become the main source of what you're doing? I think it was always my focus. Um, I am lucky to have friends who do blogging as well. And we kind of chat a lot about what works and what doesn't work. And they're not in the same niche as me. Some are food bloggers, some are sewing bloggers. And so we just kind of convene each month and talk about um, how much, like we list out exactly how much money we made, where those income streams come from so we can learn from each other. Um, and I think the very first thing I did to monetize my blog is um, Google ads. and. As my page views grew, I worked with, um, I'm at, I now work with an ad management company called AdThrive. They're wonderful. I believe you have to have 100,000 page views minimum to have them manage your ads. Um, but I will tell you, I, I don't think art and lettering is a, a niche where you're ever going to see insane money. Unless you get over the 1 million a month page view mark, you're not going to be seeing tens of thousands of dollars from your ads. Um, I typically see about 4,000 each month, which isn't bad because I don't have a lot of ads on my site because I just don't like how it looks. Um, but I have friends who make $25,000 every month in ads on their site, which blows my mind. And it's always a constant battle between um, you have to make money to make this a business. And this is what I do day in and day out. But I also want to think about my readers coming to my site and not have them be annoyed with ads popping up and all kinds of stuff. So I really tried to put my reader experience over that money side for that slice of the income pie. I love the, how transparent you are about how much money you can make doing it because I think a lot of people don't want to talk about that stuff and that's why a lot of people don't realize how much you can actually make a living doing that. So I think that's awesome. Um, and you're touching on what your goals are with it and how much you wanna help your readers, which I think is part of your 10 tips, right? So right. Um, at the beginning we were talking about how Dawn is going to share with us her 10 tips for blogging as a creative business. So I think I'm just gonna let you get right into that if that's okay. Cool. And will you, um, Becca, if you see questions pop up in the feed, will you, you can stop me anytime to um, kind of address those. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of talk at you. And um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll call out the questions and I'm also going to pop up each of your tips on the screen as you're talking about okay. them. Um, and just for anybody watching as well, we're going to get to this a bit later, but Don has a really, really, really awesome free course on this online. Like, I just came across it today. I didn't even know it existed when we were about to talk about blogging, but it's the most helpful resource ever. So I'm putting that link up on the screen for right now. And if you go there, she's got all these different lessons about how to blog as a business. So if you're interested in it at all, that's gonna be really helpful for you. But I will get my face off here now. It's all you done. Thank you very much, Mike. That's so sweet. Um, so if I'm looking at the screen, I'm just kind of referring to my notes as I talk to you guys. So tip one is to be generous. One of my favorite quotes of all time is by Danielle Laporte. Um, she's um, a really excellent businesswoman. I think following different people who, who you admire their businesses, really you can learn a lot from them. Um, and she said, make generosity part of your growth strategy. And I feel like that fits in so well with blogging because you're giving away a ton for free. Um, I didn't sell anything for years. I just gave my readers things for free. And I relied on that little bit of ad income as my um, income to keep me going. So don't be afraid to give things away for free. As you start to add e-products or services, you can use those free blog posts and give people free content to, um, to upsell your product. So it's, I am not a salesperson by nature. I don't feel comfortable doing it. I feel um, like I don't want to force people to buy anything. So if I give them something for free, I can kind of soft sell 
oh, I'm, this lesson is for free. If you want to do the exact worksheets I'm doing, here's a link to my worksheet. So it's completely optional whether they want to buy it or not. Um, and for me, that just feels more comfortable. I don't want to be pushing my products constantly. Um, I don't want to send eight emails for one product launch. I just send one. Um, and that's what works for me. It's very different what might work for you. Um, let's see. Tip two I, I have a question. I have a question yeah. before we get to that. And I think a lot of people are probably wondering this too. Um, if you're just getting started with blogging and you want to be helping people with you know, how to learn hand lettering, for example, what would you say, like, if you don't have a product to sell, or you don't have any other blog posts you can send people to, or you don't really have that much content at that point, like, what would, what would be your advice for people to figure out what their first blog post topics should be, or what they should even be talking about in their blog posts? I feel like this is so cliche to say, but write what you know. So blogging is so much work. I don't think people realize how much goes on it goes into one blog post. You have to write the post, take the photos, edit the photos. If you have a video, you have to publish it and promote it um, via all different social media and Pinterest. One post can easily take me eight to 10 hours. So um, write what you're passionate about or blogging will burn you out. So if I wasn't doing what I love, um, I would have quit years ago. I still have days sometimes where like it's too much, but then I take a few days off and I get bored. So, um, you know, if you are passionate about teach the teaching side of lettering, then create worksheets you can give your readers. If you are passionate about teaching them how to do lettering projects, then focus on that. Um, you know, there's, I feel like it's overwhelming to start because there's so much. Um, so it does take some planning and maybe listing ideas. I keep a constant list of ideas. So someone asked on Instagram yesterday, how do you not run out of ideas? I, I don't really know how to tell you that other than you just don't. Um, if you keep a list, if there's inspiration everywhere. I can be walking down a street shopping for something totally unrelated and have an idea come to me. So I just use the notes app built into my phone and keep a long running list of ideas as well as a Google spreadsheet just full of editorial content ideas. And I also, one of the easiest things to do is to create a series. So say, you, I, what I used to do, I do this via my email now, but I used to do it on my blog. Every single month I put out a um, monthly calendar and I would hand letter a design and add some watercolor florals or something and create a free calendar they could download and print or put on their phone. And that was one of my most popular posts each month. Because it's time sensitive and not evergreen content, I eventually learned that it was probably best to move to my email. But because I do that every single month, it's an easy, easy thing for me to know, oh, this second week of every month is a calendar or the fourth week of every month I'm doing a lettering worksheet. So if you create an editorial calendar like that and can create series for yourself, it makes it so much easier. Which you talk about the editorial calendar in that free course that you have as well, right? I do, yeah. So I think that what you said right at the beginning when we were talking about how to start coming up with content, you said something about, um, just using what you know and I think people get really bogged down with trying to come up with these crazy elaborate blog posts that are going to be the most useful blog post on the planet for how to learn lettering and make it like 10 pages long but I think the easiest thing to do is to take like all the stuff you know and break it down to little tiny categories the blog posts don't have to be huge they can just have Absolutely. like one one nugget of wisdom per blog post and the stuff that you think at this point is like duh I mean, I know what pen to use is going to be mind blowing to someone else who's just starting. So that's a really good thing to keep in mind for sure. Right. Absolutely. Couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah. Um, so I guess the next tip would be to be consistent. And when you are working for yourself, that is so much harder than it sounds. So part of that is planning your editorial calendar, but setting deadlines for yourself. I am extremely rigid with my personal deadlines and getting stuff done. So if I put something on paper as a deadline, I do it. You have to treat it as a business for it to succeed as a business. So you can't uh, be wishy-washy and say, I'm going to post twice a week and then not do it. So follow through is a huge part of growing it. Um, and I know that's hard if you're doing it as a side business to start, which a lot of you would. I wouldn't just quit your jobs and start trying to blog as a business. Um, you need to build a foundation and make sure um, that you're legal and you have all these, it is fairly low cost to start up, but you're not going to make a ton of money right away. I would give yourself a year maybe to grow it and really get to the point you could maybe say goodbye to your corporate job as a realistic goal. It varies and what you put into it is what 
you're going to get out of it as a general rule. Um, so are there any questions in there yet? No, I just think that it's uh, like what you just said about not, you don't want to just quit your job and see if you can start doing this. It's an important thing to kind of start doing as a side hustle before you take it full time, just to see if you actually are going to be able to be consistent and have that stamina, because it is a ton of work. It's not just writing a blog post and leaving it there. Absolutely. You might find you hate it. And um, that's I've had friends that that happened. They gave up not blogging altogether, but blogging as a business because they just didn't like the the pressure. But a lot of that is your personality too and how you handle that stress and um, personal accountability for making sure you do what you need to do. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm one of those people. I don't think that I could ever have a blog with as much content as yours or just be as consistent as that because I don't like writing. And I just, it's not part of the business that I want to have because it would burn me out. Like I, so I focus my time elsewhere and every once in a while I'll put up a blog post, but I can't say that I'm a professional blogger because I just, it's not something that I think I could do as a full-time job. <laughs> and I think that's awesome that you bring that up because it just goes to show how many different um, routes you can take there, you know, your income should never be all one thing. I like to, and in the re, in the e-course, I really break it down for you. I show you my exact income chart, what portion comes from ads, what portion comes from products, what portion comes from um, different things and really break it down. So I don't love being on camera or um, teaching in person, although I've started doing that more and getting better at it. Um, I you have to really look at what you're one person. So you only have so much time in a day. You have to sit down and look at what brings me the most return on my time investment. So um, I took an e-course recently that was um, just okay for as much as it cost me. But one really great point in it was you need to write down your tasks. And if there are $10 tasks that you do, you need to hire those out to a VA. And if you have tasks that bring you $50 an hour or $500 an hour, that's where you need to focus your time with only so many hours in a day and so many things that you have to do to keep a business running. Yeah. And we could, I think we could talk about that and the, the more advanced strategy where you're hiring yeah. people and stuff all day. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's only so many things you can do, like you said. So yeah, and we okay. need time to watch Netflix and all that. So, <laughs> um, so my next tip is to be your reader's master problem solver. So one of the best pieces of advice you will ever get, and this is kind of general advice floating around on the internet, um, is that, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. So it's easier for you. What I did wrong in the beginning when I started doing products and even blog posts is putting out what I thought my readers wanted instead of um, making sure that I was asking them that what they wanted. So it's a lot easier to find products for your readers than it is to find readers for your product. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So when I did my newest product launch, I did a seven question survey just to ask them what they wanted. And it was not what I thought I was going to put out. And I did exactly what they wanted. And so far this month, I've made $7,000 off that one workbook. So it's a lot easier for me to just give them what they want, because then it sells itself. So that's just something to think about whether it's a product or a blog post. Um, people love to tell you what they want, just ask. That's all you really have to do. So Don, what would your advice be to people who don't have readers yet? If it's a brand new blog, um, where where should people be getting the ideas for what to write? Okay, so um, my mom was probably my only reader for years. She comments still, you'll probably see her on blog posts. Sometimes I'm like, mom, you can't say that on my public social media. Um, I wouldn't even worry about who your readers are in the early stages. You write your posts and promote them as if you had a big audience. Just, you know, I know that sounds easier said than done, but put it out on Facebook as if you're speaking to a big group, put it on Instagram, just treat it. I mean, for me, I try not to focus too much on the numbers because social media, for me anyway, I don't feel like is a place that brings me much income. So it's not a place I invest a ton of my time. I have a lot of it automated. And for me, I look at social media as more of a place to um, grow community and engage my readers. And I think if you do that, it takes a lot of the pressure off of you to grow your numbers. Um, 
The other point that I kind of think about when I think about how um, small the readership was in the very beginning is I often sometimes kind of wish that my readership was still that small because I actually personally connected to the people that were reading. And I try to do that now, but it's just not the same. Like I can remember the first time I ran my online program and I think there were like a hundred people who did it. And I personally took the time to email each and every single one of them and ask them for feedback. So you don't have to have this huge group of people reading it to send a survey to you can just reach out to the five or ten that might be reading it and it'll be even more personal that way absolutely and i think a small readership is naturally more engaged and companies are actually from what i've been reading uh there's a huge trend in working with what they call micro influencers so they are finding that they're getting better results from people with smaller readership so um don't be upset by having a small readership. You, you, when you when you are a niche where you can find a company or brand you want to work with, that can be really beneficial to both of you. Yeah, for sure. All right. Oh, here's, a, if I would have just read my quote here, it would have been easier than me tripping over my words um, earlier. So two things, find customers for your products, not products. Sorry, don't find customers for your products, find products for your customers. Um, and that was actually a, a quote from Seth Gooden, which I think invented, he, I'd have to Google it, Twitter or something. He's probably not Twitter, but something like that. Somebody very successful. And it's, I feel like genius advice and it's so much easier than doing the reverse. And then when it comes to selling, either your blog post or your product or whatever you're trying to get people to engage with, um, sell the problem you solve, not the product. So it's much easier for you to sell them on I'm teaching you how to hand letter than buy my workbook. Um, so really talk to them about how you're meeting their needs and what problem you're solving instead of trying to sell that specific product. Or blog posts. I treat blog posts just like a book product too because um, that brings in income just like a product does. This slide's driving me insane. Um, my next tip would be to find your tribe. Logging is can be really, really lonely. I am in a house all day by myself. Now I have three kids and a husband, but still eight hours a day, I'm usually by myself in this house. Sometimes I don't leave all week. So if you can find um, a tribe of people that are also blogging, whether it's through a local society like the Rising Tide Society, if they have a chapter in your area or a local, you can see if you can find a blog group, um, attend a blogging conference. I have been to Snap Conference. I have been to Type A Parent, which wasn't super great for my, my niche, but it was still, I learned a lot. Um, Penner's Conference has a lot of locations. Those are a great way to not only have fun, but to meet people that you can continue to have a relationship with and help each other grow. Um, so definitely, you know, find at least one other person that you can talk to blog in about because, um, I don't know if, if you're married or you have a boyfriend or girlfriend that you talk to them about if they don't understand it because that's not what they live day to day. It's a little harder to connect. Like my husband can talk to me all day long about being a pilot and flying an airplane, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I don't really know what he's talking about. And I'm sure the same goes when I'm trying to vent about blogging stuff to him. So it's really helpful to have friends. Um, let's see. My next tip, and this is a hard one. Um, this is one I, I did not have early on. Um, but to compete in today's blogging game, I think you have to be good at taking photos. So my early photos, I was broke as a joke. I was selling things on eBay to buy my kids diapers. All I had was my phone. So if that's all you have, use your phone to take photos, but be careful and edit them, make sure they're in focus, um, buy some white foam boards to make your pictures look bright and well lit. And um, they do not have to be professional photographer quality, but they need to be pretty. Um, I we just photo- did uh, last week, actually, in this live Q&A, we did a session with a photographer who does flat lay photos and she taught yes, us. Yes, I thought a lot of that. That was awesome. awesome. Yeah, so um, that is... Then- a few weeks before that, we did another one with, you know, tips on like what phone board to get, how to do a reflector, how to actually edit the photos with your phone. So if anybody's watching and hasn't seen those and needs some tips on photography, those are on the YouTube channel now. So the happy ever TV and you can rewatch all of those. They will majorly help you with Don's tip number five. Absolutely. Um, and I've taken some online classes on like Skillshare or Britain Coast classes are really affordable. I love to take and they're short. Um, 
So just anything you can do to continually grow your skills. I'm constantly taking online classes for even programs I already know, Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, any of that kind of stuff. I just, the more you learn, the better off you are. I try to take Friday afternoons as my day to learn a new skill or grow a current skill. Um, let's see. Oh, and you can use stock photos too, if that helps you. Like, um, do you, if you guys know what a mock-up is, it's just a photo say of a clipboard and it's blank and you can put your lettering on that clipboard without actually having to take a photo. So you can get a really professional looking result by um, putting your lettering on a stock photo. And you don't have to know Photoshop to do that. You can use free programs like Canva. Um, I had one of my blog contributors do a blog post for me on how to use Canva to do that exact thing. So if you search, use the search box on my blog, I have a lot of that kind of info on there. Um, so tip six kind of goes back to what I was talking about with this series, do more of what works. So you do have to, I'm not a numbers person really, but I do have to spend some time looking at my analytics and WordPress and see um, what blog posts are getting the most traffic. And you, can, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, keep doing more of what seems to be working. What are your readers responding to? And um, if they like it, then you can probably put a little twist on it and keep doing it. Um, every single month. So an example is my friend Kimber blogs at the Pinning Mama and um, Easy Family Recipes. And she is one of my greatest resources for um, growing as a personal blogger with someone who's in a different niche. But she does these chicken bake recipes and her readers love them. So every single month or even more often, she does a different kind of chicken bake. And she saw that those posts were doing so amazing. She just you know, a pizza chicken bake, a pesto chicken bake, a Greek, take the same idea and change it so you can keep reusing it. Um, and that's something that will really help you with your editorial content too and having more to post. Wait, uh, speaking of that, and you were saying to track what's, what's working and what's not working, we got a good question from Richard on Facebook. He asked, um, well, he said, Question about staying current because fads can come and go and markets can get saturated. Do you do anything to track trends, explore other outlets or other products related to hand lettering? Yes and no. So I feel like hand lettering is trendy right now. So that's obviously been great for business, but I started doing it before it was trendy and I'll be doing it long after. So yes, I do try to look at what is trendy and try to maybe, um, you know, gear my post towards that. But I also try to really focus on classic evergreen content that will be good for years to come. And sometimes, um, especially if you've been blogging a long time, it's good. Google likes when you go back and update an old post and put new graphics in. So sometimes if I have a couple year old post that has kind of crappy graphics and pictures, I'll spend a day going and updating those, creating new graphics, updating the content, um, and republishing it. And Google really likes that. That's good for your SEO juice. And that will help you rank higher, which gets you more page views. Um, so in the class, this is kind of a, a, it could have its own hour. But the two things I focus on most are um, building my email list and search engine optimization, which is a lot more fun than it sounds. Um, so if you want to get more into that. I respectfully disagree point. with you. <laughs> I would hate it. Like, it's so not my usual kind of thing. But the more I got into it, the more I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. And I use a plugin called Yoast SEO, the paid version. Um, there's a free version. So you can start on that. It's just fine. But I use the paid version of SEO. And you basically input all these keywords and things. It tells you it tells you exactly what to do. And I work on that till I get this little green light that says your SEO is good. And then I publish my post. Um, it's not as, the basics are not as intimidating as it may sound. Okay, so back to back to well, uh, you covered Richard's question for sure about tracking trends. Um, but back to how you actually know what's working. How what are you you're using Google Analytics? And do you use anything else to track? I that do. So WordPress has some built in analytics. So I use those a lot. I use um, Google Analytics. And I also will um, keep track of like what's doing well on Pinterest, because Pinterest especially if you're in the creative niche, can be such a huge generator of traffic. Um, so Pinterest is not technically social media. It is a search engine of its own. So when you are posting things to Pinterest, um, you know, you want to have long images that do well. You want to think about keywords and SEO. Uh, again, completely separate from your blog posts um, on Pinterest. I Now, if you, most analytics lump Pinterest and with all the other social media. 
um, to give you a, a good idea of how valuable Pinterest is to creative blogs, of all my social media, Pinterest brings in 90 plus percent of my referral traffic. Even with almost 100,000 Instagram followers, it never shows on my analytics. So it is not it is not a good platform for me to post a link and get people to my site. I know that Instagram stories, you can swipe up, but it's still, it's not where my time is best spent driving traffic. So I well, hope you that have, kind of I, makes sense. I, I went on your Pinterest and you have like 9 million monthly views or something like that on Pinterest. It's so crazy. And I think a part of that has, it's gotten easier to grow Pinterest than it used to be in some ways, because it used to be all about how many followers you have. And now Pinterest is saying it's more beneficial to track those monthly viewers. So um, in a lot of ways, that's a much higher number than my followers. I think I have 270, maybe 170 something followers. Um, so now that they're using viewers, it's more info helpful for me to see how I'm doing because that number goes between seven and 10, depending on the month. And if it's dropping, I think, oh, I haven't done enough blog posts this month, or I haven't been doing enough repinning of, old, of my old content and kind of maintenance pinning, I call it. Um, but yeah, Pinterest is a great place to look at trends and see what's doing well. And, um, scoping out the competition is great. I'm a person who kind of just prefers to keep my eyes on my own page and do what I love and do things with my heart more than my brain. So that can be good and bad. Um, I, I don't follow trends a whole lot, um, because I feel like it's better for me to do what I know I'm good at versus trying to be good at something I may not be good at. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. For sure. It does. It's hard to stay in your own lane, but it's super helpful for sure. Yeah. 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 Speaking um, of Pinterest, Pinterest sort of leads us into tip number seven, because it's something that I am trying to learn currently. Um, so tip seven, I've already kind of touched on this, never stop learning. So as a general rule, I try to build Sunday Fridays into my schedule. And that means um, sometimes that means I'm taking an online class so I can learn a new skill, like I said, or develop a current skill. Um, or sometimes that means I am reading a business book or I'm reading a just for fun book or I'm getting myself out of the house and having coffee with a fellow blogger in town. Anything that kind of gives me a break from being at my computer and helps me think of new ideas. Um, I met a friend for coffee last week, a new friend that blogs and we're in completely different um, genres. She's a wedding blogger and I'm a lettering blogger and art blogger, but it's amazing how much you can learn from somebody who is in a different field from you because you have such different ways of doing things. For sure. And I think, I think just this conversation is going to open up people's minds to how much they can learn from people who are starting to think of this as a business instead of just a hobby for sure. And that what, what we mentioned earlier, the rising tide society, I've gotten a lot of value out of meeting people in totally different niches and just listening to how they kind of think about their business and run their business and just hearing resources that they use and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think if you wanted to read one business book that I think um, really changed the way I do things, the book is called Essentialism. And the author is Greg McCowan, I think it's like M-C-K-E-O-N. And it just talks about um, simple, simplifying and just doing um what brings you not just good business return, but um, it's good for your soul too. It's just a really, really great book, Essentialism. Um, that made me think of a second thing that left my brain just as fast. Sorry, guys. I um, When I was pregnant with my kids, I thought the mom brain would get better as they got older and it just <laughs> keeps, it keeps getting worse even though they're all in school now. Um, let's see. Tip eight is to cultivate a community of positivity. And I think the lettering community does that so well with very, very few exceptions. I find it to be an uplifting um, and inspiring community. And I think we're really lucky because if you look at the internet at all lately in Facebook comments, it can be a very heavy and dark place. And I love that uh, as a general rule, the art community is very um, uplifting. So for me, you know, how do you deal with the person who leaves a nasty comment on your blog post or your Instagram. Um, I feel like you have every right to control the environment on your social media. So deleting a comment that is mean is not only good for you, it's good for your readers. So I feel like I owe it to my readers to, to moderate, I guess, that community and make sure that it stays positive and uplifting. So if I see a comment that I feel 
isn't um, positive or uplifting, I delete it and I don't think twice about it. So I even have a comment policy on my blog. So if you were on my e-course, I have a sample um, comment policy and I have that posted on my blog and on my social media. If you read the, the fine print, um, that requires people to be kind and respectful. Not that they have to agree with everything, but that um, we keep things kind and positive, end of story. And I think that's really important on social media because it can be a place that is hard to um, shake off negative comments. And that really helps if you can moderate it in that way. I think it's so great that you just give people permission to just get rid of that kind of stuff. I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm such a fraud if I only leave the good comments up and blah, blah, blah. But no, you like you said, you have the right to make that a positive place and to not only make it positive for other people, but for yourself. Like if it's bringing you down, why would you, why would you force yourself to go through those things? <laughs> yeah, I, um, I like Hillary Rushford. I don't know if any of you guys follow her on Instagram. She's a style blogger, but she talks a lot about how when you give a lot for free, people expect a lot for free. So you have to remember at the end of the day, um, you do not owe them your immediate response. You do not owe them your time, you know, if they're not paying customers. And take that with a grain of salt. I don't mean you should ignore your readers, but you also don't have to um, do everything the way people think you should. So give yourself some grace and really um, recognize that the internet isn't always a happy place and just kind of control that because it makes it better for you and your readers. So when she talked about how um, she didn't really do it for herself, she did it for her community. That was a light bulb moment for me that it wasn't fraudist to delete those comments. Um, it was really making it a more positive general community for everybody because nobody wants to get online and see nasty comments and it drags us all down. So delete away, I say. Well, and I, I don't know about you, but I've just noticed a lot that um, the free stuff gets more of the negative comments, which is Absolutely. kind of crazy because you think at the beginning, you're like, oh, I'm giving so much away for free. People are going to love this and they're going to be so nice. But the minute something's free, it means that anyone and everyone will be able to get it and they're not willing to pay for it, which means that they're probably there and they're like, they're not necessarily appreciating you as much as the people who are paying for your paid course or whatever. So they're going to come in and just have these crazy expectations that just don't meet up with what you're providing like I don't know I, it, yeah. it's a whole rant it could go on in another day but the free stuff always you have to keep in mind that like you're going to get a lot of people looking at it and they might not be your ideal clients or customers absolutely yeah someone asked on Instagram yesterday too do I respond to every single blog comment and um, as a general rule I do if it is something that was addressed repeatedly in the post and they just didn't read it, sometimes they won't just because again, I'm only one person and there's like 4,000 people who are vying for my um, attention sometimes, or at least that's how it feels. I, I do my best, yes, but if it's, like you said, if it's an uncalled for comment, then not always. Um, but I do really try to respond, especially because this day and age, there aren't a lot of blog comments left. And if they took their time, to ask me something or leave a kind word, I really try hard to um, once a week sit down and get back to all those people. Love it. Uh, so tip nine, be professional. I think when you are blogging as a business, this gets hard. Um, sometimes you wanna be snarky and you just can't. You have to be organized, you have to be timely and be easy to work with. Those are my three things. So I really pride myself on being timely. I am never, ever, ever, ever late. Um, I'm neurotic about it. It drives my husband a little crazy. I, I will always show up 15 minutes early before I'll be two seconds late. Um, and I'm easy to work with. So for an example, I taught a lettering class this past Thursday downtown. And they were supposed to provide a projector for me to, you know, demonstrate the lettering and teach calligraphy. Well, I got down there and it wasn't there. I had nothing to teach the class. And I could have panicked and been rude about it and been, you know, I'm not going to teach the class if you don't have what I need to teach it. Instead, I ran in my heels that I never wear, dripping in sweat around the corner downtown. I got an easel and like a giant pad of paper and I made it work. Um, so I feel like, you know, being easy to work with guarantees you future work and that um, you'll work with people long term, you know. I wanted to, this came in, this is what came in my brain earlier, what you were talking about, the um, free things, people sometimes being more judgmental. So if you are a person who sells a service or a product and people want you to work for free, those are without fail, always my hardest clients. The people who are willing to pay me my rate 
are always my easiest, easiest clients. I do feel the same way, Becca, like people who are know your value um, and kind of trust you to do what you're an expert in are always easy peasy clients. So if people ask you to work for free or work for publicity, which I feel like is a nice way of asking you to work for free, I typically run away as fast as I can because those are always my most challenging clients to work with. Well, and I'm sure that doesn't just go for client work, like actual calligraphy client work or lettering client work. I'm sure it goes for the blogging stuff as well. If you're blogging for a certain client or um, like, like what are some examples of how that would apply to blogging? So for me, a lot of bloggers will work, do sponsored work. So they will promote a brand and they get paid to do that. Um, there are media groups that will do that for you in the art and lettering niche. There isn't a lot of media groups specifically for that. So I created my own partner program and I created packages where I will do a custom blog post for them to promote their products and they get this social media included and an overall price. So right now I charge $3,000 for that each month and I only focus on one client, but I also am very picky. Like it has to be somebody who I already love their product and I feel like my readers are loved too because then I don't have to force something like I'm you're not going to see me doing something for huggies on my site you know if it's Tombo or sometimes I work with my old design school or um, Skillshare I've worked with in the past if it's a natural fit it's an easy thing to promote and you can charge for that and those clients are always my easiest that are willing to pay my rate and just trust me to do what I do. Yeah, I think it's and for a lot of people when they're starting out in blogging, I think it's tempting to just take on the clients that will pay you. Um, but I did that in the beginning, like we're all guilty of that because you're like, oh, I get a hundred dollars. Sign yeah. me up. I, I did diapers on my blog in the past before I did art and letting. So um, you'll make mistakes along the way, and that's okay. You learn from them. But yeah, if you can, um, and if you're wondering how do I figure out what my worth is? There is a website called socialbluebook.com. It's like Kelly Blue Book for cars where you can pop your stats in and figure out your car's value. This is called socialbluebook.com and you can kind of pop in your numbers and put in some of your URLs and it will give you a general idea of what you should be charging. You can even change the date because usually quarter four, you can charge a lot more with people's holiday budgets and things like that. Um, and I don't use that as my exact rate but I use that I use that exact website as my base rate for determining how to price my blogging packages um, and it's a really helpful site yeah that is that is really helpful I didn't know that existed um, okay so your tip number 10 let's go over that and then we'll get get you hit with a bunch of questions <laughs> okay that sounds good um so set goals and crush them so I it may be cheesy to say this but the people who accomplish their goals and the people who don't, the one major difference is super simple. They write them down. So I am constantly writing goals and checking in with them and then crossing them off. And I noticed when I started doing that, I was, you know, just checking goals off left and right. So every year I set about 10 goals for my business. Um, and then I check in quarterly. So if you can find, like we were talking about finding your tribe, if you can find a little group of bloggers and start your own private Facebook group, I have one of those and every month we go in there and we post our income reports and we check in with our goals and kind of keep each other on track. But even without that, um, I do it on my own too. So really sit down um, and think about what your goals are. I usually set, uh, I don't focus too much on traffic. Actually, I can pull up my goals right here and kind of tell you what some of mine were for this year. I'm also curious what, um, what you su would suggest as goals for people who are literally just, just, just about to start a blog? Uh, I would keep them bite-sized for sure. So maybe one of your goals is to, um, and, and the first post of my e-course kind of walks you through exactly how to set up a blog. So, you know, buying your URL, which is your domain name that people type into the website, um, getting set up on WordPress, which there's a lot of different platforms. I definitely recommend WordPress if you're blogging as a business. Um, and I talk about that why in the e-course, it's kind of a long discussion. Um, focus on growing that email more than your social media. So if you need to create an opt-in for people to want to sign up for your email, like maybe you say, oh, I have this free lettering worksheet if you sign up for my email. Things like that will help encourage people. I have a, a two blog posts on that too because I love email so much. Um, and if you can find, uh, if courses pop up in your feed, like a class on email marketing was one of the best I've taken, um, SEO marketing. 
those are all on Skillshare too. Like when I think of Skillshare at first, I used to think, oh, they just teach art and like lettering. And there's a lot of business classes on there too. And if you already have a membership, there's no need to go paying for other ones. I, I try to look on Skillshare before I go pay for anything anywhere else, just because I already have a membership for that. Um, and when you're just starting blogging, I wouldn't try to put out five blog posts a week. If you can commit to one, that's fine. Just make sure you're doing that one every single week. So don't burn yourself out in the beginning. Go slow and steady um, and just focus on figuring out a plan, really, because you got to think about keeping it legal, too, which is a whole other blog post in the course, because um, you, you want to do what you need to do to make sure you don't get in trouble legally, which is not as intimidating as it sounds. Um, that's actually, you just said how many times per week to blog. So someone just asked, how often do you post blogs? So I used to do uh, four per week, but I feel like that's something that's going to change and it's different for each blogger. Now that I have so much content built up for seven years and I re-promote that old content via Pinterest and social media, um, I'm just doing about one a week. But back in the day, I did a lot more. Definitely, the more you can get out, the more that usually translates to higher page views. But if page views is not one of your goals, then you don't really need to worry about that. So you really have to define those goals and work backwards to kind of see um, what works best for you. One of the other tips I got that I feel like is one of the most life changing for growing my income to a six figure blogging business was that all it takes to grow a six figure blog is $300 a day. So when I thought about that and broke it down backwards, it became a lot more manageable. So I thought, oh, how can we break that down and get to that just $300 a day? Can I get $100 from ads, $100 from products, and $100 from working with sponsorships? When you break it down like that, it becomes much more doable. So, you know, you got to think about those kind of things as well. Well, you uh, you kind of just answered my next question. I was going to ask you, and I know this is in your e-course too, which we're, we're going to send people to again, but um, what are the main, like exactly what about blogging is making you money? Like, if okay, you had to the... I'm going to pull up my little chart here so I, I don't forget um, anything. I think it's in my monetizing. So for anyone else watching right now, we have some questions rolling in, but if you have any more questions for Dawn, um, put them in the comments right now and I'll be able to read them out. Um, and someone was asking if they will be able to tune in and watch this all later because they tuned in late. Yes, it will always be on YouTube as well. So, Okay, um, so my four main income streams are ad income, affiliate income. So an example of that would be like Amazon, which used to be better than it is. Um, but that means you're promoting someone else's product and you put a link in your post and you get a little cut. Um, and that's one of those areas where you need to be sure that you're being legally compliant, especially um, in the US, there's a very specific set of rules for making sure you disclose that and say that you are getting a cut back and it needs to be very conspicuous at the top of your blog post. And then that's all in the e-course too. So for ad, uh, ad income, affiliate income, sponsored work, and then product or service income. For me, it's e-products. So those are the four main streams. Um, and in my e-course, I show you a pie chart of exactly how that breaks down. So for example, quarter one this year, 43% um, of my income was from product income. A third of it was from ad income. Um, about 10% was sponsored work and 15% affiliate work, roughly. I just, that didn't add up to 100 because I just kind of rounded up and down. But um, it used to be almost exclusively ad income. So that that will shift over time as you figure out what you love to do, what makes you the most money. Um, but those are, I think, would be the four main income streams for most people who are blogging as a business, some variation of those four things. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really helpful for people because I think a lot of people think you have to have a million posts with affiliate links and that's kind of the only way you can make money or just have your whole page covered in ads. Yeah. But we all know we don't like that. No. Although I see sometimes my friends' income reports and what they're making in ad money each month and I'm like, holy moly, uh, you can definitely earn really good money with ad income. And I feel like the it's a give and take. So if you're giving your reader something free, there's got to be a way for you to make money when you're devoting all your work hours to it. Um, and I've even asked my readers before, would you rather have no ads on my site and have there be more paid content or would you rather it be free and deal with the ads? Everybody says free and ads. So I feel like it's kind of 
uh, you know, accepted on the internet these days, every site you go on that has ads and you kind of don't even notice most of them. But as I grow my product income, I don't want to promote other brands. I want to promote my own product. So I keep doing less and less ads and replacing them with my own ads to products in my shop. So you definitely will adjust that balance as your business changes and grows for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Um, someone asked, how long were you blogging before you started making an income from it? Um, so I'm going to go from when I decided to turn it into a business. So I started blogging in 2011. I didn't really start deciding to make it a business till 2013. So it took the first year I probably made um, $30,000, which I mean, that was what I made in my first HR job. Um, the next year, I probably got closer to like 70000 And then this will be my third year making six figures, which just blows people's minds. And it feels a little weird to tell people that and put that out there. Um, but I feel like it's important because I feel like um, it's a really fun, cool job. And if there's, you know, it makes my life so much easier with my husband being in the military and us moving, like I said, every one to three years and me having three kids, you know, it's the flexibility that it gives me is um, just so great for our life, you know, with a sick kid in the next room today, I can still be doing my job and making money. And um, I feel like there's a lot of people out there in similar situations. So if I can help someone work from home and make their life a little easier, I feel like I would rather share all my secrets because um, A, I feel like there's room for everybody that's willing to put the work in. And B, it is a lot of work. So not everybody's willing to put the work in. So um I don't feel like it takes anything from me to teach other people how to do the same thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you, you really did teach a lot in that free course. So I keep popping up that uh, link on the screen because everybody that's watching this that's interested in blogging needs to go see it. Um, we have a couple more questions. Okay. How do you advertise for or approach and otherwise cultivate corporate clients for your blogging? How, like what exactly do you provide for them and how do you get those jobs? Okay, so I have and in I link this in the course, but if you were on my blog right now and you went um to my menu bar in the top corner or um on the menu bar, I have a work with me page. So you can go scope out exactly what I've done because I publish my prices online. Um so because like I was saying, there wasn't a uh media group that helped me get those clients, I had to go out and seek them myself. So the number one thing I would do is put together a package for your clients. Um, and if you'll see on my page, I not only give them a package and pricing of what I will give them, I put together um, my reader survey and demographic info to tell them, you know, like, um, this 90% of my audience is women and, you know, um, their age ranges and how, like, my reader survey told me how, how much time per day they spend on lettering calligraphy. Um, what level they are, are they beginner or newbie, um, what percent have invested in books. So I give all that info to a company when I'm approaching them. And, well, and then, I think that, that goes back to what you were saying about being professional. Like you can't expect a company to pay you those premium prices and trust that you'll do a good job if you're just going to email them and say, hey, can I write a blog post for you? Absolutely. It should be like, hey, I would love to write a blog post for you. Here's my readership. Here's how many views I get. Here's the benefit to you. And it's all in one spot that's really easy to understand. Then they know that your quality of your content is also going to be that good. Absolutely. Yeah, I keep it all on one landing page that's easy for them to see. And it's definitely a what's in it for me situation. I highlight what they get out of it. Um, and at the end of the day, like I said, I am not a salesy kind of person. So when I decided to put together this program, I sat down and I thought about the five companies I've worked with the most over the years. And I drafted a just simple little email to say, hey, I put together this program because I'm contacted so much about working with brands. Here's what I put together. If it's in your budget and it interests you, here's the info. And I did it really non-salesy. And three immediately wrote back and worked with me. Um, one was, we don't have it in the budget, but we will keep you in mind for the future. And I worked with them in other ways um, over the years. And now we have a paid relationship. So um, if it's a brand you really love, sometimes I'll make some concessions and work for products until they have um, a place for me in the budget. But um, that's on a very, very limited basis. Um, so again, because you only have so many hours in a day. So how many clients that you're doing stuff like that for, would you say that you approached versus approached you? 
Um, all the ones I work with on a regular basis, I approach. Um, but as a general rule, every other thing that I've done or had an opportunity for. Um, so for example, I did, uh, I did a donut box for Krispy Kreme a couple of years ago, and then I designed some like wall vinyl lettering for Hobby Lobby, or even doing these lettering workshops, which is now turning into a whole nother side of my business doing all these lettering workshops. I sent out like four quotes this morning to host workshops for local companies. Um, those all came to me. And I think it's simply as a result of putting your work out there on social media. Um, if you are consistent and your work is um, good, then people are just going to come out of the woodwork. I have more emails than I can handle. So it's also easy for me to just reply and send them that page and tell them this is how I work with brands and bloggers. And if they don't reply back, then I know that they were looking for me to work for free. And it's, you know, just it weeds out a lot of people to just go ahead and publish your prices. Yeah, for sure. As long as you're doing it in a very clear, concise, like making it easy to understand. Absolutely. Manner. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, I think that's pretty much all of the questions. Oh, no, we're getting more here. So um, I'll just pepper you with a couple more and then we're okay. going to kind of wrap it up. But I also want to make sure that you can show us your scrap box behind you because I know that okay. everyone, everyone wants to see it as badly as I do. Um, okay, I'm on so my I'm, iMac right now, though. I don't know if I can like pick up my whole iMac, uh, but I'll try to uh, kind of show you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So some of these are pretty specific, so you don't have to go into too much detail, but how many okay. page views do you need to start making money from ads? Um, well, if you're going to do your own ads through Google, then um, there's no minimum requirement, but you're not going to make a lot to start, maybe a hundred bucks a month. That's where I started. That's totally fine. A couple hundred bucks is a couple hundred bucks. Um, so, but if you want to work with um, so like I said, I work with Ad Thrive. Their minimum is 100000 per month. And that's where I think is probably the threshold where you're really going to start um, seeing a substantial, like at least $1,000 a month in ad income. Okay. Um, and then last one, how many hours do you put into your blog? Very much. <laughs> I'm sometimes embarrassed to answer that. I'm trying to cut it down. Um, part of e-products allows me to create that passive income where I'm making money while I sleep. So I'm really shifting my business in that way. Um, there are weeks I put in 70 hours. There are weeks I put in 30. There are weeks I put in zero. So um, as my business has grown, I've been able to kind of step away and let the money continue to roll in without working. Like this summer, we, we moved from Germany to the US and there was two months I essentially could not work. I and mean, then my income was still over 10,000 every month because I had laid that foundation. So in the beginning, I would expect to put in full-time hours. If it is your side hustle, just do what you can um, to be consistent and take baby steps. And as it can become your full-time business, treat it like one. I, uh, you know, like we live by the beach in Charleston. I would love to go be at the beach every day, but I am here in my office uh, knocking out my to-do list. So my big thing is I set three goals for myself every day. So maybe it is to do um, 10 pages of my next digital workbook, return all my emails and do one blog post. And if I get that stuff done for the day, then I'm free to go do other things, laundry, go to the beach, do whatever I have to do but I have to get those three things done every day before I move on to um, things outside of work. I think you and I have a very similar work-life balance. <laughs> that was actually someone else's question was the work-life balance, but I think you just answered it perfectly. Yeah, and um, I don't know if that exists. And that's kind of the beauty of vlogging. Like, a lot, my kids get on the school bus at 6.30 in the morning, so I sit down a lot and I work from 6.30 to 12.30 and I am a very productive person when I work I don't get easily distracted so you know it kind of depends on your personality too what I can get done in six hours someone else might be able to do in three or it may take someone else a week so it's really hard to quantify that but um yeah I yeah. As, as a minimum I do six hours a day so the one last question and this isn't from someone it's just from me and I think it would be useful for people is um when you were starting out, I mean, your course and you as a resource is very valuable. But when you were starting out, who were the people that you looked to or what resources did you look to to learn how to do all of this? That's um, that's a good question. And I feel like part of why I've been so open and honest with stuff is because I didn't have someone to ask things to. Like uh, I, I did two books um, with a publisher. Don't go look them up because they're really bad. But when I got that book deal email, I had no one to ask if this good or not. Um, I 
and that's a really lonely, scary place to be. And, and especially when it comes to giving up months of your life for a certain amount of money or what have you. I, I can't say that I really had anyone in the beginning. I was just kind of willy nilly floating around trying to figure things out to the best of my ability. I Googled a lot. Um, I'm really good at Googling things. Um, and now I'm very blessed to have a group of uh, bloggers that I feel like um, and Facebook groups that I feel like are a great resource to bounce ideas off or get um, different opinions of people who maybe are experts in different areas of your same field. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have anyone. So that's a big reason I did this course. So if you have questions, I am always available via email. Sometimes I try to get back within 24 hours as a general rule, but um, I do have a, a Facebook group for my blogging stuff. I don't really advertise it just because uh, my focus, my main focus is teaching people lettering. But if you email me, I can um, definitely shoot people a link to join that where there's other people that are getting started with blogging. Um, actually, I can tell you the link real quick if you want to. And that's a kind of a place where people ask me um, a lot more in-depth questions. And I'm pretty open. If you ask me um, money stuff, I'm, I'm pretty open about just sharing. Oh, my Facebook doesn't want to cooperate. I think even though you don't necessarily have any one specific that you would look up to, I think you've mentioned even just a couple topics that you learned more about that helped you because it's not like you can't Absolutely. necessarily just look up blogging as a business. I mean, I'm sure there are resources that you can just Google that, but it's it's kind of a bunch of moving parts like learning search engine optimization and learning how to use WordPress and learning how to, you know, charge for your services and that they're all kind of... Absolutely different pieces that go together. And I know I've said it 10 times, but just the link that's on the screen right now is Dawn's free course. It's free. Why would you not do it um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff? Because she covers all of those moving parts. So it's a great resource. And the group is facebook.com slash group slash Dawn Nicole Co. So Dawn Nicole CO. Um, I did have two separate blogs. I, I, I was blogging about blogging as a business on one and art on the other. It was too much work to do two blogs. So I combined them recently. I read it all the graphics to make it fit my current blog. Um, so the name of that group was my other blog. But that is where we talk about all things blogging as a business. Um, and basically anything goes as far as what you want to ask me. Well, thank you so much, John. This has been really, really helpful. Thank you um, so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so I this will obviously go on YouTube and there'll be a blog post and we'll put all these links and the link to Dawn's, um, Dawn's free course has come up multiple times over here, but I'm going to put it up once more. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention was that um, Dawn created a coupon code for this talk. And if you're interested in buying any of her stuff on her website, um, you can just put in the code Becca and you'll get five bucks off any orders that are more than $20. So thanks for that too. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but I think other than that, unless you had anything else you want to talk about. No, do you want me to kind of uh, ship this and show the scrap box real quick? Yes. Yeah. So if anybody doesn't know what a scrap box is, you need to go look that up. Um, the videos of these go viral on Instagram and uh, Facebook all the time because they're so cool. And, Don and is I have a full blog post. It. Sorry, Becca. Because you're the only person I know that has one. So I'm I'm intrigued. I want one. It's amazing. It was it's probably one of the most expensive things I've ever bought. It's about two thousand um, dollars. but I am a business investment, perk of blogging as a business. Um and um it just it literally holds everything and you can see I still have room. And this survived the trip from Germany here. Um the company is actually American based, but they have European divisions. And it all closes up so you can hide everything, which is fabulous. I have a blog post um, that kind of shows you what it took to put it together and details my full thoughts on it. But it definitely is um, one of the best investments I've ever made for sure. So good. I need one. Maybe next time we'll talk, I have one. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again. It was so nice to talk to you. And, uh, Thank you. And I look forward to seeing in your Facebook group as well. Thanks so much, Becca. Bye, okay, everybody. See you later. Bye. So guys, just before we hop off here, um, I wanted to just remind everybody that's in this Facebook group that Show Me Your Drills is back open and we start again on October 1st, which is Monday. So one week from today, we're restarting the whole free Show Me Your Drills challenge to learn lettering basics. 
Um, and I know a lot of you in this group have already done it or are already well versed in lettering, but if you want to join it again, you can just go to showmirrordrills.com and uh, I would love to have you back even if you've done it before. So hopefully you guys love that conversation with Dawn and uh, we'll see you next week.